Everyone, thanks everyone for coming. Um, really pleased to see such a good turnout. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, this is the Criminology Society, so student run society that have organised this talk tonight. Um, so we'd like to welcome you all again to thank you for coming. This is Sean and um, he's here to tell his story. The rest of that I will leave um, very much down to his capable hands. Hope you enjoy the talk. Um, a piece of paper will circulate um, towards the end of the talk and the question and answer. If you want to be part of the prize draw for the books um, and the other prizes that we're offering, you need to just write your name and your email address on that, and if you're a winner, it will be um, emailed to you and announced on various advertising platforms that you've all been contacted about this. Hope you enjoy yourselves. Um, so, over to Sean. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for being here, everybody just come to tell you my story. In a nutshell, went to school up in between Liverpool and Manchester. Took my business degree over to Phoenix, Arizona. Worked my way up and became a millionaire in the stock market as a young person. The money went right to my head. I had more money than common sense. Started to throw rave parties with it. Had people, people bringing ecstasy over from Holland, so I was knowingly breaking the law, so I'll take full responsibility for what happened. May 16, 2002, SWAT team smashed my door down and I ended up in this jail that's got the highest rate of death in America where not only were the gang members murdering the prisoners, even the guards were murdering the prisoners. Now, it's going to be a very hard-hitting talk and there's going to be some graphic images. If anyone's squeamish, I'll warn you before they come up. The structure is, I'm probably going to tell my story for about 40 minutes and then um, we're going to take a 5 or 10 minute break and then we're going to open it up for our questions and answers. And I'm willing to stay for as long as, as well as many questions you guys have got. I'll, I'll stay and answer them all. Um, it's going to start to get a bit gruesome in about five minutes, but I'm just going to give you my backstory first, um, going back to my school years. Here's what it looked like when I was about 14, and I had a full head of the Wham style her. See, was that, that's me on the left. So at this age in my school, only a handful of us chose economics, about six of us, and the teacher really took me under his wing. He was giving me lessons on my own, he was teaching me how to read the Financial Times, explaining what it all meant, and I got really interested in the stock market at that young age. At 16, I started investing in the stock market, I borrowed 50 quid off my nan, doubled it in BT shares. So I was hooked on the stock market at this very young age, and telling all my mates, I'm going to go to America, make a million and fly you guys over. Because we were just from this little chemical manufacturing town, we didn't have much money. So my dream was to get all my friends out of there and, and take them over to America. So I went on to sixth form, did A-levels, maths, physics, economics, and then went on to Liverpool Union, did business studies. Now, when I graduated, England was in a recession. Hard to get a job, a bit like it is now. But I had two aunts in Phoenix, Arizona, I said, just jump on a plane and come out here. You get a job real easy with English accent. So that's what I did. I didn't have any money. I just went out with my student credit cards. And I got a job right away as a stockbroker. And you guys seen that movie, The Wolf of Wall Street? Stockbroking sounds fancy, but if you've seen that movie, you know that it's just glorified telesales. Day one at the job, my boss slaps the phone book down and says, you need to call 500 numbers a day to find people to buy shares. That's been the office for the six o'clock in the morning, sales meeting, call calling all day long. First couple of years, I wasn't much good at it. I was worried I was running out of credit on my student credit cards. I was going to have to come home because it was commission only. I was basically living off cheese on toast and bananas. But five years in, pursuing my dream, working these long hours, I'm the top guy in the office. Grossing half a million a year, got my own staff, secretary, call callers. I'm only in my 20s, and I've got enough money to retire. Put that money into technology shares, and they shut up. And that was how I became a millionaire. But I was also throwing raves. This goes back to when I was at uni. The acid house scene had started in Manchester. It was news headlines every weekend. Young people breaking into warehouses, airplane hangers wearing all this crazy coloured clothing, dancing to what was a new style of music, and taking this drug, ecstasy. So I've seen this on the news and wondering what the hell it was about. And a mate out of Manchester, he says, come and check this club out. Went to the club, tried ecstasy, tried speed, kept doing drugs and not thinking of the consequences. 
When I got to Arizona, the rave scene was very small. I started throwing house parties at first. I've got the most money. I'm showing off, buying everybody drugs, thinking I'm Mr. Cool Guy and it's never going to catch up with me. I'm getting as addicted to the attention I'm getting from throwing these parties as I am getting addicted to the club drugs. But I'm not thinking about where it's all leading and it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So at the peak of it, I was in a million dollar house on the side of a mountain, got my own security team, bouncers, got my own rave, clothing, music store. I think I've got it made, but I've been breaking the law for so long and getting away with it. Our arrogance is such, we're joking that we're above the law and it's never going to catch up with us and all this stuff. But it always does catch up with you sooner or later. And on May 16th, 2002, was when the SWAT team smashed my door down. I was charged with talking about illegal drugs on the phone. It was a conspiracy case, and I was the, the ringleader of this ecstasy ring. Over 100 people were arrested with us, SWAT team raids. Half of them were girls, a lot of local uni students. Anyone who called up and bought pills on the phones was arrested because the cops had been recording all the conversations. All of my money and assets were seized, and I never got any of it back. But bail was set at three quarters of a million cash only, so there was no way I was going to get out of this jail. I don't know if you're familiar with this jail. It's the guy who dresses everyone up in the black and white, the pink underwear. He's got tents out in the desert. It's called Tent City. That's his famous jail. His name is Sheriff Joe Arpaio. He prides himself on being America's toughest sheriff. So I've got a video on my YouTube channel right now that's got a million hits. It's the guard screaming in the jail I was at. He's supposed to be watching this and stopping any trouble. Wasn't watching it close on this particular day. It's a video of an Aryan brother prison gang member murdering another inmate who's refused to beat someone up for the gang. Method he uses to kill him, for almost 10 minutes, just smashes this guy's head over and over and over into the concrete. 10 minutes in, the guards still haven't responded. And you can see him, he just starts stomping on the back of the guy's head and neck and, and blood's just going everywhere. 20 minutes in, the guards still haven't responded and the guy's well dead by now. Picks the body up, brings it out right in front of the camera like he's trying to show it off. Tries to throw it off a balcony and gets stuck on a railing. He just starts kicking it over and over and over again until the guards notice what's going on and put him down. This is how much control the gangs have got in these place, places over the prisoners versus the guards. Now, because I had female co-defendants, I knew what was going on the women's side as well. One woman was pregnant. She sat on the toilet and she had a miscarriage and she collapsed and passed out on the floor. The guards come in, revived her with smelling salts, ordered her to fish the dead baby out of the toilet and didn't give her any medical treatment whatsoever. And the other women in there were pregnant, they, they chained them down, they shackled down in that position while they're giving birth. Now here's what the cell looks like, about the size of a bus stop shelter, originally designed for one person. Over the years, they put three bunks, one on top of the other, so it's way overcrowded. And the toilet is the seatless thing at the front. So when you go on the toilet, the guys you live with on this side, the guys in the day room on this side. It's embarrassing on the toilet with people walking around you, which is something that you've got to get used to. Phoenix is the hottest of the big cities in America. It gets up to almost 50 degrees, and it's hot all year round. Way too hot to be wearing these Roman jail outfits. So to try and stay a little bit cooler, everyone's going around their underwear, which are pink boxes. Even so, we're sweating constantly. What starts to happen is we get these skin infections and bed sores that itch and bleed, especially on our behinds. Problem is when we scratch ourselves, when you're sweating day after day and there's no end to it, the outer layers of your skin start to turn soggy. So you get this itchiness and you scratch yourself and clumps of your own skin detach under your nails. One of the hardest parts for me was at night, just sat in this pool of sweat. And the, t the itchiness is keeping me awake. I don't want to scratch myself because the skin's going to come off. And I've got all these bleeding and itching um, bed sores as well. And the sweat's tickling me. And I remember one night I fell asleep on my side. And my ear filled up with sweat. I didn't, I didn't realise it. And as I changed sides and turned over, the sweat just ran all over my face. And it was like someone was touching me. I just woke up startled as if someone was like coming to get me, just stroking my face. So, how do, you, how do you guys rate the food then here at this uni? Reasonable, so a nice pizza. <laughs> In the jail we got two meals a day, 
Breakfast came in a plastic bag. Moldy bread and green bologna. Green bologna, it's a raw sausage meat that's gone past its sell-by date. It's got a green shine to it. A lot of the food coming to the jail was in boxes that businesses were throwing away because it had expired. The mold on the bread, blue, green. Sometimes the mold on our bread came in these fantastic psychedelic colours that looked like works of art. And we were so hungry, we just scratched the mold off the bread and because it was stale, put it in water and swell it to get it down. The evening meal was a mystery meat slop we called Red Death. It looked like carroty vomit blended with blood. It had all kinds of random meat in it and it stunk. Sometimes there was dead rats in it. On one occasion we complained, we gave a dead rat back to the guards and they said they'd investigate it. They came back later in the day and said the jail won't get any trouble. They said it was just a potato. There wasn't much we could do. The boss of the jail, Sheriff Joe, one of his um, favourite quotes, it costs us more to feed our police dogs than our prisoners and our police dogs are working for a living. He said it cost him 50 cents or less a day to feed the prisoners the rotten food. It's all completely gang controlled. You've probably seen a bit of this on, on YouTube, all these videos about the prison gangs in America. It's, it's all true. It's racial gangs in America. In Arizona, the four major racial categories were whites, blacks, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans. Because I'm white, as soon as I walk in, Ernie and Brotherhood come up to me, First thing they want to know is what your charges are. And you can't lie because your charges are on a little printout. So whatever race you are, again, we'll do this. There's no way around it. Now, some charges are K-O-S, <coughs> which means kill on sight, such as paedophile stuff. Other charges are S-O-S, -S, smash on sight, and beat you up severely, such as drive-by shootings, because women and kids sometimes get hit. So anyone coming into the prison with a sex offence, the gang's going to try and murder them, but at the very least they're going to smash them. So once you get through that interrogation then about your charges, you have to go and meet the head of the gang, explains all the rules you must follow or else the whole gang will smash you. If someone calls you a punk, bitch, or hits you, you must fight them on the spot or else the whole gang will smash you. Must take showers or they'll smash you for bad hygiene. Can't go make your friends with the guards, they'll smash you for snitching. Can't go sit at the tables with the other races, they'll smash you for that. Everything you take for granted about your safety in society is reversed in prison. They're constantly looking for people to beat up because that's how they earn their reputations and their tattoos. It's called putting work in to earn your political ink. And the more serious the act of violence, higher up in the gang are the tattoos that they earn. Under every head of the gang, a guy's called Torpedoes. Torpedoes will go in and smash someone, no questions asked, just so they can earn their tats, which look like this. The guy on the right, he was getting escorted to medical one day, snatched the guard's gun, shot him dead and escaped. He didn't get very far, he was rearrested at a local McDonald's. This guy on the, on the left, that's the full Aryan Brotherhood membership. To, to earn that, the Warbird, to, you've got to kill someone in the jail for the gang to be a full member. It was half Hispanic where I was at. Who knows what the teardrops mean? Yeah. The, um, the teardrop for each person you killed. Exactly. Yeah. Do you know what a clear teardrop is? It's an outline. Does anyone know what an outline is? A clear teardrop. A clear teardrop is sorrow for the loss of a fellow gang member, and then when you murder the rival who murdered your fellow gang member, you fill that teardrop in so that it's solid. The preferred method to kill you is with a shank. They strip metal from all over the place, and you hear them at night shouting them into knives. All those in the background are homemade knives that have been confiscated by the guards. Now, my, my job now is I, I go over the, across the country speaking to mostly uh, schools, uh, over 100 talks a year, trying to put young people off drugs and crime. And the next set of images, particularly gruesome set of images, of people who have been attacked in the jail by gang members. So, you know, I include them so that they can see the, what drugs lead to. But if anyone in, in here is squeamish, um, I suggest that you just don't look. I'll go through them pretty quickly. <coughs> He was murdered during a race riot. 
stabbed in the head, shanked across the face. Again, cut him so deep he could stick his tongue out through his cheek. So I'm in the medium security remand for my first year. My parents, they're not rich people, like I said, we're just from this little town in the north. Um, but they remortgaged the house to cover some money for a lawyer. It's like, look, Charlotte, get you out of jail. Go to court, have a bail here and get your bail reduced. You can fight your case outside. I'm getting all excited, yeah, finally getting out of jail, girlfriend's excited, <coughs> all the local family shopping court, uncle, ex-police officer, speaks on my behalf, obviously put his house up to supervise me, seems to have gone really well, except prosecutors trying to make her you know, name off the back of my case, she sabotages the hearing, and the judge, when he makes his ruling, he doubles my bail to $1.5 million cash only. When your bail goes over a mil, you're automatically reclassified from medium security remand to maximum security. Thought these guys were hardcore over here, about to get thrown in and worked to where it was nearly all murderers. So the night I got moved, it's about two in the morning when I walk into the cell. It's dark inside, but there's some light coming in from the day room. First thing I notice is it's a two man cell. Oh, that's an improvement. But I'm wondering why my cellmate is asleep on the top bunk. Because where I come from, people fight over the bottom bunk. So I'm thinking something's not quite right. So I'm walking some more. I start to sense movement on the walls and the ceiling. I think my eyes are playing tricks on me. So I put my face right up to the wall to see what's going on. And it's covered in these guys. I got used to the violence by now. Trying to get to sleep with his crawling on me, gave me a nervous break. Now let's get put on medication. Eight at night is lockdown. Ten is lights out. They know when the lights are about to go out. They start lining up in the cracks in the walls. It's kind of like this, this style wall where it's a really old building and there's loads of cracks everywhere. And they're about the size of a um, almond and they just squeeze through. And you can see them just before lights go out, they're like this. Like an army waiting to invade with an antenna sticking out. As soon as the lights went out, that was it. They just flooded the room. And you got a choice. You can wrap a sheet around you so you look like the mummy, leave a breathing hole. It does keep them off you. But the sheet traps the heat to your body. And like I mentioned earlier, you've got all these bleeding and itching, skin infections and bed sores. The trapped heat makes that condition so unbearably itchy that you can't possibly sleep. So you end up just throwing the sheet off and letting them crawl on you. Now fortunately they don't bite. They start out tickling your feet, your limbs, the palms of your hands. To this day if my girlfriend tickles my hand, I flinch because I just woke up so many nights with the cockroaches tickling my hands. They try to get in your ears to eat your earwax. It's like honey to them. Is anyone in here asthmatic? Any brave asthmatics? And the neighbour in maximum security was asthmatic, wakes up one morning, out of breath, grabs his inhaler, takes a blast, shoots cockroach inside himself, says he can feel it moving. He throws up his stomach contents trying to get rid of it, so it's stuck inside him and it won't come out. Most of them disappeared. But even in the day, there was still a lot. I mean, they swarmed at night, but in the day, they were scattered around. So the, in the daytime, the prisoners would grab, grab some of them and put them on the tables in the day room and have cockroach races and gamble on the winner. And first thing in the morning, the fellas would come up themselves with plastic containers they put peanut butter in to trap them during the night and they'd empty all the dead ones into the trash can. It didn't matter how many we killed. They owned the building. Now there was another threat from the insect world that also came out during the night that did bite. And you guys don't like spiders. There were spiders out there as big as my hand, tarantulas with big fangs, but they were friendly when the prisoners actually made pets out of them. There was a much smaller spider called the brown recluse. Recluse because you never saw it. And it would come out at night looking for food. You'd roll around in your sleep, touch it, get you. 
And you might not think too much about that, you just wake up with a couple of pinpricks on your skin. But as the venom took its toll, it would eat into your flesh. The pus would start to come out. And it would, on some occasions it would eat right down to the bone and cause what's called a volcano lesion. There were guys in the jail who'd been in shootouts, and as you're about to see, unless you're squeamish, these spiders are putting bigger holes in people's bodies than bullets. I'm only going to show the next image for five seconds because it makes some people feel ill. So if you don't want to look, please don't look now, I'm going to count down. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> longer I was spending in captivity, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. All the human rights violations were disgusting me. deadliest jails. I started thinking the world has no idea what's really going on in here. Maybe the world should know. I started to make a diary of what was going on in there. Writing about the infestation, the food, the violence. on a mission to bring awareness to the world. But I can't put these things in the mail. The guards can open the mail. So I recruited my aunt. My aunt went to visit me on the weekends. And I hid what I wrote in eagle paperwork. I could release property to my aunt through the visitation guards. The whole time I'm watching the guard at the corner of my eye because this stuff is on his table. My heart is going like crazy. Is he going to search it? Is he not going to search it? doesn't search it. He yeah, has it to her. My stress just collapses. She typed what I'd written up. And that's how my blog, John's Jail Journal, started. If we did it under a fake name, John's Jail Journal, the guards wouldn't know who I was. I couldn't believe some of the things he was writing. I realised that this was hell on earth. It was unreal. It was like it was happening to somebody else. But in a way it helped because it made me feel close to him. I spent all day writing. My whole day revolved around that. It was a bridge to the outside world. So now the world was hearing about my life and the lives of the other prisoners. And it went on to attract all this media attention to the conditions of jail. It closed down two years after I started blogging about it. Well, that sheriff runs six different jails out there, so a lot of this stuff is still going on. There was a statistic that uh, the National Geographic came up with, 62 people died over five years around the time I was there. And they weren't big bad gang members. Some of them were mentally ill prisoners murdered by the guards. Brian Crenshaw was classified as a partially blind shoplifter, failed to produce his ID for the evening meal. The guards pulverized him, broke his neck, severe internal injuries, he went to a coma and he died. Scott Norberg was a mentally ill man wandering a neighborhood. They brought him in. The guards started beating him and electrocuting him with tasers. 
A female guard tried to stop it. Stop beating him, his face has turned blue. They pushed her off and they kept beating him. The inmates watching from the holding cells started yelling, Why are you still beating him? He's already dead. And even after that, they continued to beat the corpse, turn blue and everything. Both of those cases were caught on camera. Family members of the victims of the guards sued the jail and awarded compensation. The question for you guys is, what do you think the boss of the jail, Sheriff Joe, did to the guards that were found responsible in federal court for murdering those prisoners? Brief suspension. You're going in the wrong direction. Murder. Yeah, <coughs> promoted them and gave them pay rises. He prides himself on being America's toughest sheriff. He's been at war with Obama over the human rights. He's saying to Obama, I'm elected in Arizona, I'm going to do whatever I want. Students protesting the human rights chain themselves to his building, get them all arrested and thrown in his jail. I'm just going to read you an excerpt from the very first stuff that my aunt smuggled out of the jail. Just to give you some background, we've had no running water in the jail for three days. So the toilet me and my cellmate sleep next to, it's so full of sewage that the mound has risen above sea level. And my cellmate wants to use the toilet. And here's what happens next. 20th of February 2004. My cellmate couldn't hold it in any longer. He pinched his nose and lifted the towel from the toilet. Repulsed by the mound, he said, there's way too much crap to crap on, dog. I'm going to use a bag. So as jail etiquette demands, I rolled over on my bunk and faced the wall. I heard something hit the rim of the seatless toilet and him say, Damn, I missed some. When he was done, he put the finished product by the door and the stink doubled. There was no water to clean when the piece had fallen on the toilet, so it remained forming a crustacean on the rim. We were hoping to be allowed out to dispose of the bag until the guard announced, There'll be no one coming out for showers and phone calls as we have to get 120 inmates water from an emergency container. The water came back on in stages. In our toilet, its level slowly rose. Oh no, I said. It's about to overflow. And we'll be stuck in here with sewage all over the floor. One of us needs to stick his hand in the crack to let the water through, my cellmate said. And you're the closest. The brown soup was threatening to spill from the bowl, so I put a sandwich bag on my hand. Can't believe I'm doing this, I said, plunging my hand into the mound. The mound took the bag from my hand, almost up to my elbow in sewage. I dug until the water level sank. I owe you one, dog, my cellmate said. It's your turn next time, I said. Because the tap water hadn't come back on, I couldn't wash my arm. Not wanting to contaminate anything in the cell, I sat on the stool until the guard let us out for showers, hours later. So, I'm in my second year in the jail now. You guys, criminology students, probably aware of the plea bargain system in, in America. Um, so, I'm in the plea bargain system, and the prosecutor's saying, every time I spoke about drugs on the phone, carries five to ten years, I've got twenty plus charges, if I dare go to trial, if I dare exercise my right to a trial, they would stack all of my charges and I could get up to a maximum 200 year sentence. And I saw people get decades of drugs in Arizona. There was a guy that had a, a drug case before me who I did actually get 200 years. So, in the end, I uh, signed for nine and a half years and I served just under six. And it's a function of money out there as well. Basically, my parents were mortgaged the house, cast their retirement accounts, got almost $100,000 to pay this lawyer all this money. And he intimated to me by way of saying that he played golf with the judge on the weekends, that possibly some of that money was going to the judge. So I figure if, I had, if my parents hadn't come up with that money, I'd probably still be in prison right now. So once I was sentenced, I got moved over from the remand jail to the state prison system. You guys know what colour the outfits are in the prison system, state prisons. Anyone seen orange is the new black? Started out with the orange jumpsuit. The prosecutor had played a number of legal tricks on me throughout the remand period. I can get into the details of those and the questions and answers if, if you're interested in that side of things. But the final one was, my sentence was nine and a half years, comprised of three sentences. The smaller sentence, I think, was 26 months. 
It was accidentally put down on the paperwork that the prison system was 26 years. So I was fast tracked to the super maximum security prison as the highest risk category prisoner with the most violent, dangerous prisoners, including death row. My first neighbor was a serial killer. My first cellmate was a Satanist. He's got a satanic pentagram tattooed on his forehead and for murder, part of a cult that was drinking blood and eating human body parts. And he was actually very nice to me. He just read a book about Leonardo da Vinci and he gave it to me and we discussed it. I didn't have any problems with him whatsoever. Got us moved to medium security, hoping they'll be a bit softer. I was wrong. My first cellmate in medium is this guy on the left. He's a serial home invader, torturer. He's breaking into people's houses and taking hammers to their kneecaps. His welcoming statement to me, I've got a padlock in a sock. I can smash your brains in while you sleep. I can kill you whenever I want. He knew my family were flying 5,000 miles to come and visit me for Christmas. So we got his mate, this 20 stone California biker, to attack me just when my parents had flown over to visit me. I have no idea. I'm just walking along to visit, happy as can be. Big guy sneaks up behind me in a crowded corridor and bam! He starts kidney punching me. All the prisoners stop to see my reaction because the gang rule is you must hit back or else you're a punk and everyone's going to prey on you. But if you do hit back and the guards see it, you're arrested and sent to a prison within the prison called lockdown and you lose all your privileges including your visits. So I had to think fast on my feet. I spun around, tried throwing some kicks and punches. It was like hitting a big bag of cement. And he was trained in kickboxing. It didn't end up very well for me at all. He spun me around, smashed me up, knocked me down, ended up going to the visit all injured. Mum's asked me what's wrong and I cannot say because she's either a nervous breakdown of my situation. I didn't want to stress her out any more than was necessary. When I get back from the visit, the big guy, he's got a young person dangling by the neck from a second story balcony. My cellmate, he's getting high out on heroin and meth. There's, there's more drugs in prison than anyone on the face of the earth, at least in Arizona, what I experienced. And he's keeping me awake all night, interrogating me, and he's even showing me the padlock that he's going to smash my skull in with. I got so scared it was the only time I called for outside help. I called my family and said, look, you put Collins in the British Embassy, see if they call the prison and try and get removed. I'm worried this guy might try and kill me, I can't sleep around him or anything. But when they call the prison, they can't say anything I've said that would get him in trouble, because that would make me a snitch. And it's K-O-S, kill on sight for snitches. All the prisoners want to kill me. Now fortunately, he was moved about me getting in any trouble. He was throwing batteries at me, for a couple of weeks afterwards until I got a cellmate who was bigger than him and had some words with him and it stopped after that. Now because my blog was getting in the news, some of the more extreme characters started asking me to put their stories on the internet. On the blog, people started to send me letters, started to send the prisoners letters, started to send the prisoners and me books. We were filling the whole uh, library up with books in the prison because of the kindness of these blog readers. And the blog became a, a, a bridge to the outside world for us. So I'm just going to touch on these three guys um, real quickly. Tebow, six and a half foot, former Marine, trained to kill, seen action in South America. And you guys see that movie, The Green Mile? The prisoners actually call him John Coffey after that character in that movie. That's how big he is. First time Tebow came to my cell with the um, door to introduce himself, completely blocked the sunlight out. I just ran a little stool, I turned around, he just stood there with his pants on. His body's covered in scars, massive scars. Looks like someone's cut him up and sewn him back together again. So I started asking about his scars, and every single one was a different life and death prison fight story. He was the ultimate prison gladiator, but not only was he standing up himself, he was stopping the raping of the young people coming into prison. And prison rape is really prevalent in America. He was risking his life over and over, he wasn't just knocking these guys out, he was getting stabbed, he was getting hit in the head with river rocks and socks, he was in inches of losing his life on more than one occasion, helping these people for no reward whatsoever. So, you know, obviously he's done wrong to put himself in prison, but obviously the guy's got a big heart as well. I, I just found it really inspirational to see what he was doing, ris ris risking his life like that. Now, um, Frankie, Mexican mafia hitman, he was in for murder for hire. He beat that case because all the witnesses disappeared. But throughout his entire life, throughout his entire life, he's, he served um, 29 years, only spent 13 years as a kid outside of institutions. And you guys seen that gangster movie, Goodfellas? 
where Joe Pesky, you must have seen maybe Joe Pesky play the uh, gangster at some point or in some movie. He's a bit like him because one minute he's cracking jokes and everyone's um, laughing, and next minute he's deadly serious and everyone's afraid of him. First time Frankie came to my cell window, I was locked down, my pants and boxes were down, and I was applying antifungal ointment to the bleeding bed sores on my behind. He took one look at this through my window, disappeared, and decided to play a practical joke on me. A couple of hours later, I got a mysterious love letter shoved under my door, commenting on my hurry arse and proposing we have a gay prison marriage. <laughs> His exact words were, I'm looking forward to shampooing your hurry ass on our honeymoon in San Francisco. <laughs> Fortunately, that was just his sense of humour. He was a chess heavyweight, and I started to play chess on a regular basis, and there was no kinky sex stuff involved. <laughs> Zena, six and a half foot, charismatic transsexual, a man who believes he's a woman trapped in a man's body. Zena wakes up one morning, drinks a cup of coffee, grabs a razor blade and starts to cut his man parts off. Gets the right side off, gets the left, gets the left side hides inside himself. He's got his hand up in his guts looking for it and he's bleeding to death. And they get a helicopter to the prison just in time to get into hospital to save his life. Now I'm bringing Xena into it because we're getting to the most graphic part of the whole talk which is about prison gang rape. And this has particular relevance because um, some of the students who showed me around earlier said that there's some conference about sex in prison and this is the extreme end of it. I have had a couple of sixth farmers faint during this section, so I'm just going to say right now that if there's anyone in here at this point in time who feels like they would prefer to just go out and get some fresh air, uh, I can call you back in in five minutes. I would rather you did that than you faint and you fall down and bang your head and hurt yourself in this situation. All right, then. Everyone, everyone's good to go. Everyone's good to go. Um, okay, so when Zena first came in 20 years ago, he didn't look like this. He was a young person, he was big, he was weightlifting, he clicked up with the gang as a debt collector, and it's blood in, blood out. And these gangs just use people up. And when they finish with them, they, they do horrendous things to them, maybe murder them. Z I'm going to read you a conversation. This is Zena telling me what happened to him after the gang had finished with him. The first time was a gang rape. They beat me up, stuffed things inside my body, beat me until I was unconscious, raped me while I was unconscious. What did they stick inside your body? A broomstick. How would you know if you were unconscious that they raped you? When I had to go to the toilet, I could tell by what came out. What did you do after being raped? I sat in myself for two weeks waiting for the scars to go. I got moved but the same thing happened. They beat me up, used me as a sex toy, a prostitute, a punk. There's no recourse, no one to talk to. You can't go to the guards and they throw you in lockdown for months or years in a dungeon and say it's for your own protection. You can do absolutely nothing other than kill the perpetrators. Did you think about killing the people who did this? I thought about killing myself first. I wanted to. I still do sometimes. At this point, Zena started crying. And he couldn't answer any more questions. But he came back later in the day because we were writing a blog to raise awareness of prison rape. And I said to him, have you got advice for parents whose youngsters are in prison for lesser charges? Marijuana, drunk driving, does this mostly happen to youngsters? Yes, it does, but it can happen to anyone. Big, bad dudes, skinny, even the ugliest in the world. People who come to prison who aren't street smart, they get preyed on the most. How did you stop it? I took the abuse for as long as I could and I started fighting. I won most of the fights. When I stood up and told them I didn't care about getting killed, it stopped. You've got to be ruthless. You've got to be ruthless. That's understatement. Zena hadn't told me the truth as to how he'd stopped this gang raping business because he didn't want to risk getting in trouble for what he'd done. Zena was studying anatomy and he came up with an idea. The next two times the gang came to rape Zena, the first member of the gang to put his hand on Zena. Zena plucked his eyeball out so it was dangling from the optic nerve. That's what it took. Now there's usually someone worse off than you in the prison system. At the same time, Zena's friend who was gang raped, they held him down, took a light bulb, 
shoved it in his backside and smashed it while it was in there. He had another friend who was gang raped and decapitated. He got a shovel from the work crew, held him down, cut his head off. When the head was finally off, they picked it up and they positioned it in an area of the prison to make to the, a point to the other gangs that they were the most violent and ruthless out of all the gangs. They looked at me as a visitor to their world with my little nine and a half year sentence. They were all serving decades. The stories they told me blew my mind, and that's why to this day I continue to put those stories on the internet at my blog, John Shield Journal. Now, I've not come here today to whine about getting caught selling ecstasy and ending up in here. I take full responsibility for all the stupid choices I made when I was running around on drugs. I was asked earlier by the students that showed me around about what, what were the psychological causes of what led, led to me uh, taking drugs. As a teenager, I went through a period of anxiety and it was compounded when I was almost murdered. The most violence I've experienced wasn't in prison or by the mafia or anything like that. I just passed my driver's license test and I went to take my mum's little red car to a petrol station to fill it up. I got attacked by four drunks, big guys. And they got me down, they were kicking me in the head. And then one pulls out an iron bar and they just started hitting me in the face a bit, knocking pieces of my teeth out and stuff. And it got to the point where the pain was really bad and then it just stopped. And they were still hitting me and I was wondering what was going on because I couldn't feel it. My whole body just went warm. I was thinking, you know, they're not beating you up. But this is what dying feels like. These guys are they're trying to kill you. And in the end, I just passed out and I woke up on the floor with blood and teeth and bits of teeth and my car windows smashed. And that made my anxiety worse. And then when I went out to clubs, you know, I wouldn't get up and dance, I was too self-conscious, I wouldn't go and speak to women and stuff like that. But when raving began, I took ecstasy and all that melted away. And I couldn't stop dancing and making friends with people and it, it brought me out of, of that um, anxiety. So it was like self-medication for it. And I was so emotionally mature when I had all that money Misguidedly, I thought, you know, let's just keep the party going for everyone and start throwing all these parties. I saw the lure of the fast cash as well, and I stopped, you know, my slow and steady progress in the stock market. And I got greedy, and because of that, I lost absolutely everything. I was worth two million in the stock market without getting involved in the raves. Because I was getting all this attention from being this shy, anxious student, to suddenly throw parties for thousands of people, getting all this attention, you know, being the man. I was, I was addicted to that tension as I was addicted to um, the, the drugs. But I wasn't thinking about where it was all leading. So um, that, that's pretty much the root causes of, of you know, what, what, how I got involved in it. So I got back, I lost absolutely everything because of that. Um, I'm on the dole, lived with my parents. First year back in the UK, got released in December of 2007. Hard to get a job, criminal record pops up at the job interview process. The doll said, you know, when you fill out these forms for jobs, just don't tell, just lie, tell them you don't have a criminal record, otherwise you're never going to get any work. Um, certain countries now I can never travel to, I'm pretty much restricted to Europe, I found out. Four months ago I got an email asking me to go and speak in Japan, I contacted Japanese embassy in London, and they said because you've got a drug conviction in America, you're never going to get into Japan, so I lost that opportunity. I wasn't thinking about my mum and dad, getting my party friends high, when I should have been. You know, they're 5,000 miles away, I was thinking, I'll never find out. Two months after my arrest, there was this cover story out of Phoenix. English Sean's evil empire, 10 pages long, I've it in 10 times more. They portray me to be a cross between Walter White and a vampire. So I think my mum and dad have not got to see this. The gentle people that's going to break their hearts, they call my hand, don't let my mum see this. It's too late, Sean, there's an internet version. My mum read it, she was a college teacher, she had a nervous breakdown. And she went to the college after reading it. She went up to some students, I know you've read the article, I know you know what's going on. Didn't have a clue what she was on about. My dad had to get her from the college, she's not off medication to this day. Now last week I was up in the Northwest doing talks and I stayed at my parents' house and I, I could still see the hurt and pain on their faces that I've caused them. People say, Sean, you've lived this wild and crazy life, is there anything to change? As well as regretting putting people on the road of drug use, I want to take that hurt and pain off my family's faces, but I can't make it sick to my stomach. And I've got to live with that for the rest of my life. Um, an important thing I learned from the therapist, I've got this risk-taking adrenaline junkie personality. That's why I like ups and downs of the stock market. But he taught me that it's all energy. 
I was choosing to take my energy and put it into negative addictions, racing around in my sports car on crystal meth, hanging out with all these gangsters in the drug community, all this stuff that could have got me killed. I still sometimes hear the wolves howling from the party scene. If I hear that old school rave music, it sends a jolt of excitement up my spine, I get that goose flesh feeling. But I remember what the therapist said, it's all energy. I go to the fitness centre now, do karate, come out on natural high. I jump around with 60 women on these body combat classes, the thumping dance music. It's like you're raving now about the drugs, and you come out on a natural high. I think I'm all right, I'm at my 45 minutes now. Um, we're going to take a five or ten minute break. Um, I do have some books for sale here. All the proceeds of the books are going to prisons, prisoners to get books, state schools to get books, and, and prison charities as well. Prison charities include the Howard League for Penal Reform, which I just spoke at um, a week or so ago, and the Kersler Trust, who help prisoners rehabilitate through art and writing. They, they actually help me as well. And, and prisoners abroad, who um, help prisoners who are overseas who come back to the UK and help them get back into the workforce and stuff like that. So every single penny from the book purchases is going to get books to those uh, various categories that I just mentioned. All right, that's, that's my talk for now. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. All the rave party stuff and everything that led to my arrest and then hard time is the um, punishment, it's the jail side of it. So it's all my true story. All right, so who would like to be the first person to ask a question then, please? Oh, yeah. People ask me a lot um, what got me through, and let's see, is this on or is it off? It's just coming on now. It's just coming on now. Okay. Hello, hello. It's got this in a kind of funny thing. Okay, let's start again. All right, people ask me a lot what got me through it, and you know, big things for me were my family support. I was blessed to have such strong family support. A lot of people I met in prison had been disowned by their families because of repeated involvement in drugs. The blog readers sending me letters and books, sending my fellow prisoners letters and books. In terms of spirituality, I got deep into yoga and meditation. When I got moved in with the cockroaches and the murderers and I couldn't sleep with the cockroaches calling me, I started to hear imaginary voices going days without sleep and seeing imaginary cockroaches. And, you know, I got to the point where I was on the brink of, of, of suicidal insanity. They told me I was facing it for 200 years. And they did put me on medication at that point. But what got me off the medication was meditation. Um, I was doing yoga and I just started to meditate for hours and hours at night, every night. And, I, you know, I felt the anxiety going down. I got into the yoga in my first year, my sister sent me this book, Yoga Made Easy. And I hid it under my mattress because I didn't want the gang members to see it and to think, you know, I was a sissy or something and pick on me. So my sister kept on at me, have you tried yoga yet, have you tried yoga yet? And I did try it. And I lay down on the floor and I felt all the stress and tension just melting out my shoulders. I thought to myself, I used to take drugs to feel like this, you can actually do this naturally. Because I've got this magic energy, then I, I threw it into doing yoga and the meditation. My dad sent me a book on extreme yoga postures. And when I was in super maximum security prison, at night the prisoners would talk sometimes late until the night, three or four in the morning, I couldn't get to sleep. I put wet toilet paper in plastic and put it in my ears to make earplugs and try and block it out, but I could still hear them. So I thought to myself, do I just want to toss and turn and, and, and be angry that I can't get to sleep, or can I turn this to my advantage? So I pledged to do yoga for as long as they talked, and some nights it was like three or four hours a night. So I was getting in all these upside down positions. I remember the guard comes along doing a security walk, and I'm hung upside down like a bat in headstand lotus or something, and this guard's like, my god damn it, Atwood, what are you doing? <laughs> and I got away from being ashamed of doing it. To, but at the end of it, I was, when I was doing these poses out on the rec field when I got moved down to medium and minimum security, and the prisoners started coming up to me and asking me to teach them a yoga class. And by the end of it, I had taught them my own unofficial little yoga class. Yeah, so that, that was the extent. You know, medita I looked at the meditation and you know, that's the extent of my spiritual um, stuff that I did inside there. Is anyone else got any questions then? Yeah? Have you considered um, writing or uh, advising? for sort of executives or approaching them about um, ecstasy as a gateway drug. Um, a lot of governments and 
stuff or you pick up at the moment for civil rights laws like cannabis as a gateway drug. But surely you went straight into sort of like a rave scene and party drugs. I would consider talking to anyone in power who could, you know, make policy changes that were positive to help people with addiction issues. Because what I saw was, you know, before I got arrested, I believed the media that prisons were just full of serial killers, child rapists, and all this kind of stuff. Lock them up and throw away the key. And I can understand why, you know, a lot of people in the public feel that way. Now, getting in there myself and seeing that it's nearly all people with addiction issues 90% of them were shooting up heroin and crystal meth where I was at. Two thirds of them hepatitis C, which was slowly killing them. Um, seeing that the mentally ill, is, the prison system in America is the biggest house of the mentally ill. Seeing that a lot of returning war um, soldiers were coming back with mental illness and ending up in there because they didn't have any support. A lot of my friends in the prison system were like ex-marines and stuff like that. And hearing all those sad stories, they didn't have the advantages I had in life, a lot of these guys. It really opened my heart to what was going on in the world and all these corporations in America just making money off the backs of these people. People are commodities. It's $50,000 a year of taxpayers' money per prisoner in these private prisons. They're just warehousing people. A million arrests a year in America right now, I think, for weed. And it's all about just filling these bunks up to keep these profits going. That's why America's got 25% of the world's prison population. Nearly everyone in America has a family member or a friend in prison, basically, right now. There's been a bit of a backlash against that now. We've seen some of the states loosen the drug laws. Um, you know, but, but, but seeing all that just really, really opened my eyes um, to what was going on. What was the question again? I've got a lot of tension. <laughs> what was the question? Oh, about the road of drug use? Yeah, um, so I started over here on the road of drug use, where I thought it was fun and it was cool. The SWAT team took me off halfway down here and perhaps saved my life. I credit them with saving my life. The guys in the jail who were shooting up the heroin and crystal meth, 90% of the inmate population I was housed with, all the day revolved around was getting the drugs in. And it was so sad. And they were killing themselves with hepatitis C and they couldn't stop it. So it, it, it showed the road of drug use to me, which I wasn't aware of before I got arrested. Before I got arrested, all I was thinking of, just keeping the party going for everyone, this is fun, this is a buzz. I didn't understand the road of drug use. So you said about pot um, and ecstasy being gateway drugs. My opinion is, I hear that bandied about a lot, but my opinion is that lifestyle has this long road and whatever drugs you start at, you then put yourself further down that road. And that's why I go into the schools and say, look, here's what could come at you down that road to try and make them see you know, you know, what's ahead of them. Well, not everyone's going to uh, destroy themselves on drugs. In neuroscience, they're saying people, so many of us have got this gene now, addiction personality, addictive personality, and they're the ones who self-destruct. Two thirds of young people in this country are presently trying drugs, and the average one starts in the late teens and finishes in the mid to late twenties, and they go on to have normal lives. But the criminalisation of it, we've got two million young people in this country with weed um, convictions that are having real difficulty getting back into the job. Market and you know, so I think that whole the whole drugs law thing needs to be relooked at because it's a massive disaster for the taxpayers. But you've got all these corporations making money off it that are keeping it in place, and in America they make massive political contributions to both sides. So whoever wins the election just keeps these contracts going. Okay, next question, please. Yep. Um, how do you feel your personal and professional opinion on? Um, legal highs and obviously the increase in penal response to legal highs, their distribution and their use. It'd be interesting because obviously talking of gateway drugs, a lot of them they are, are for young people offering a gateway sort of where they feel protected from penal measures and trading that off with the legalisation of substances. Okay, legal highs are a direct response to making drugs illegal. These chemists are trying to outsmart the laws with these synthetic um, formulas. And these drugs are untested on people. And that's why you've got, you know, the kids taking them don't, actually, they're the guinea pig generation for these drugs because they don't know what's going to happen to them down the road. And people are dying from them because, you know, they're completely unsafe. You don't know what the, um, what kind of reactions can happen. So it's because of drug laws that, these kids are going out and taking the um, 
legal highs and having these bad reactions. And also with ecstasy, we've seen, what is it, 10, pe 10 young people have died so far this year taking fake ecstasy. Um, it's got an ingredient in it called PMA, these pills. Now the reason these people are dying um, from the supply side of, of the things is because governments have tried to stamp out legal ecstasy. And to try and stamp out legal ecstasy, they've gone to the people making the ingredients, such as the sassafras, and they've, they've you know, had them reduce the supply of sassafras. So the ecstasy manufacturers are now making these pills that don't have the proper ingredients for it to be real ecstasy. They're putting these other ingredients in, um, which are toxic, PMA is toxic, and what, if, if someone takes a PMA pill, they kind of feel like they're on ecstasy, but not enough, and they don't, it takes, it's slower to hit them, and they think they've not took enough of it, and they take more because it's toxic. The toxicity racks up fast, and that's, that's what causes the deaths. So again, the war on drugs, knocking the sassafras suppliers down, these fake pills are being produced, which are killing people. So it's another un unintended, unintended consequence of, of drug laws. Yep. I was interested in the response to your blogs, and they must have pretty much known well, they came to you in prison that you were releasing it, and how you managed to keep that going on. And also, as a result of the blogs, how is it Sheriff Joe? Mm -hmm. um, what was the public outcry in America about his actions? Or were okay, first question. Um, I started the blog in the maximum security remand jail run by Sheriff Joe Arpaio, where the guards were routinely murdering the prisoners. That was the place that 62 people died in all five years. My mum didn't want me to do it because she knew about these deaths that I described to you earlier. Um, we, we ended up deciding to do it under my fake name, you know, John. And the, the jail never ever knew that I was doing it. It was way too dangerous for them to ever find out. And once I got moved up to the prison system, which is a separate legal jurisdiction, in America, jail and prison are two se separate entities. Jail is where you're on remand, and prison is where you go to serve the balance of your sentence. In the prison system, I felt comparatively safer because each building was actually named after a guard who'd been murdered by the prisoners. It's more the other way around. Now, blogs were just starting to get the news back then. The wheels of bureaucracy are quite slow. Um, they did cotton on to it. And a sergeant pulled me out, and he said he'd been commissioned to read the whole thing to see if I'd used any real names, which would have made it a threat to the security of the institution. And he hadn't found any real names. That's all he was assigned to do. And he, he said he liked my um, sense of humor, and he enjoyed reading it and seeing, you know, it seeing it through the eyes of an inmate. But afterwards, um, since then, the prison and the jail are both classified by books and my blog as a threat to the security institution. And the prisoners, they're not allowed to write to me. They send letters to someone else and he forwards them to me. That's what happens. One of the guys started a blog on the back of my blog, and he was still in there. Um, they moved him four times in a year because he was blogging, which is very unsettling. And they also, he also lost his good time. They basically extended his sentence for blogging. But you know, your freedom of expression is guaranteed under the Constitution. Anyway, he ended up, oh, the reason he stopped and the reason he actually got released was a lady wrote to me who read my blog asking me for a pen pal and I referred her to him. She went out to visit him and they ended up getting married and um, they, she said she, she, she needs to stop blogging so you can get out. <laughs> so that's a happy story, it's not all a catalogue of horrors. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's, that was your first question. All right, so your second question, could you repeat that, sorry? Yeah, I was just interested on the public reaction in the States about Sheriff Joe and his uh, unacceptable... Okay, I allied myself with some um, other people who were campaigning against the Sheriff around the time my blog came out and it got in the news, the BBC and stuff like that, including Mothers Against Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Um, one of the mothers, her son had been murdered by the area of Robert in Ten City. Another one of of them, it was a lady who was actually her brother, Sheriff Joe Arpaio and his team had tried to coax a mentally ill prisoner who just got released into buying bomb parts to blow the sheriff up. And they went to sell this kid the parts at a restaurant, they surrounded it with police and they surrounded it with media and they made this big headline about how this kid was going to, a terrorist gonna, who was going to blow the sheriff up and kill him. It was all over the news. So he said facing life in prison. He's, he's only remembered for like four years, I think. And um, he went to trial, and the trial, the jury uh, found him innocent, and, and not only that, said it was a blatant publicity stunt by the sheriff's office. 
So campaigning with these guys around that time, it was a combination of factors that got that jail closed down, the maximum security jail. But he runs six different jails. Now you asked in terms of the effect my writing has had on the American response. Uh, the biggest effect I had was my Bank of Abroad episode. It's called Locked Up Abroad in America. It premiered to 10 million people about two years ago in, in the States. And I woke up to 500 emails and it went up to 1,000 by the end of the week. And those people were completely outraged. They didn't know this was going on, a lot of them. People who previously voted for the sheriff said they were no longer going to vote for him. So, you know, he gets elected every four years and all we can do is just keep campaigning and keep raising people's awareness because people don't care about prisoners until their son or daughter gets arrested for weed and they're getting a call from a jail saying I'm stuck in a cell with someone who's got a shank and threatening to rape me and I need $10,000 to bail out. Generally people don't care about prisoners, it's just this forgotten world. Um, so all we can do is just keep on campaigning and, and, and keep you know, exposing what's going on and raising awareness in the hope that the tide will turn and this guy won't, won't get elected one of these days and they'll create a more humane system. I'm not saying it should be easy but you know, do we want all these people in prison and getting out and committing more crimes? Because that's Arizona, which prides itself on having the toughest prisons, has got the highest crime according to FBI statistics in the whole country. But that's what our politicians are doing. They're looking, they're, they're looking at the U.S. justice system and, and introducing measures here, privatization and stuff like that. But we should be looking at the Scandinavians because the Scandinavians have got the lowest crime and reoffending in the world. It's a more humane approach. They give the, the, the guys job skills, counseling, and all this kind of stuff. But there's something deep rooted in the human psyche that feels, lock them up and throw away the key. I understand it because I thought that myself. And I understand it how the media just plays it up about gourmet food for prisoners and playstations for prisoners. And they just keep that mindset going. And that's why the politicians in conspiracy with these private prisons can make all the money off the back of people with addiction issues and get away with it, which is basically what's going on. Yeah. Yes? You've told us about the prevalence of rape and drugs inside prison. Do you think that's going to be as big a problem following like the privatisation of the prisons in this country? Okay, the privatisation of the prisons leads to <coughs> extreme gang behaviour in America. That's, that's what I saw personally. If you bring a private prison in, they say we're going to do this, we're going to save you that, and all this kind of stuff. But what happens is then, because they're maximizing the profits, they, they, they keep the guards to inmate ratios at a real dangerous level. In, in Arizona, they cut off the, the perimeter um, guards that were going around at night. And some prisoners actually escaped and went on a, on a murder rampage. So if you've got two prisoners watching hundreds, I'm sorry, if you've got two guards watching hundreds of prisoners, it gets completely gang controlled. And the gangs can just do absolutely anything that they want. So when you go into prison, when I went to prison, I had to pay a heed to the, uh, the prison rules. But even more so, maybe, maybe um, more important was paying heed to the gang rules because they've got powerful life on, on death over you. And if they want to rape you, if you've done something, and they, you know, there's not much you can do to stop it. It's so prevalent in America, they have a rape class. Rape class is, under PREA, Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, we have to all go in now and watch this video where um, these prisoners try and lure young prisoners in with, with candy and stuff like that, and it teaches you not to get in debt with these guys, otherwise they're going to come back and ask for sexual favors and stuff like that. And it's, the bottom line of the rape class was, to stop rape, we have to report it. Now, if you report anything in prison, you're a snitch. And the rule for snitches is KOS, kill on sight. And one of the guys said, how can we report anything? You know, that would make us a snitch. And then right after that rape class that I attended, a young mentally ill prisoner was gang raped and no one reported a thing. So, you know, the private prisons come in and they, they say, we're going to do this and this and this. But at the end of the day, they're boasting in their annual reports, such as Corrections Corporation of America, because in my degree, you know, the business, finance, stock market, forensic accountancy, I read annual reports. Corrections Corporation of America are saying in their annual report to their shareholders, our profit growth is guaranteed because reoffending is so high in our, in our prisons. We're not, they're not correcting people, they're breaking them. If you treat people like animals, they will get out and, and some of them will behave like animals. 
And it's allowed to be drug and gang infested, from what I saw, because then these guys don't spend a chance. They come right back and keep that $50,000 a year of taxpayers' money rolling into prison. The gang knows it as well. The gang gives these young people, young people come in with, with weed heads or club drug heads, and they come in, click up with the gang, start shooting up heroin and crystal meth. The gang give them these neo-Nazi tattoos on their faces, swastikas, SS lightning bolts, because they know when they get out, they try and get a job. You know, there's just no chance in hell. They're gonna come right back to prison and, and be part of the gang. So these people go in and both sides are stacked against them. The prison is stacked against them and the gang side is stacked against them. It just keeps this crime going, keeps it going. From what I saw, it was a revolving door. Okay, that's what I <laughs> First one was, are facial tattoos prevalent? Um, when you go out on your everyday life, you generally don't see people with facial tattoos. Now, in prison, you will see people with facial tattoos, but not everyone's got facial tattoos. So, you know, I showed, some, I showed the extreme end of it in my pictures. So if I go to prison where there's a couple hundred guys, for example, maybe five guys or less are going to have them all over, completely all over the faces, and look, look like that. Okay, let's go on to the second question now. What was it? Uh, is it more linked to, say, being identified with that gang, or is it more about earning your tattoos? Okay, it's all gang culture from what I was aware of. And, you know, to earn your tattoos, you've got to put in work for the gang. That's, that's what it's all about. You can, and that means committing acts of violence. Okay, there's a third. Uh, are there certain gangs that are more known for this, or is this kind of... All of them. It's, it's, they're, it's like they're competing against each other to have the baddest tattoos. Yeah. And was the, was the thing was a bit more than that, was that it? No. Okay, that's it. Okay. Well, thanks for the questions. Um, all right, anyone else got anything? Yeah? T-Bone Appreciation Society. <laughs> oh yeah, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to give everyone a one of my cards. These are the cards I get out on the screen, just with my internet links. If you want to grab one and just pass it to the next person. Which also has the T-Bone Appreciation Society link on it. Um, T-Bone, I, like I mentioned, I, I tell my story to schools, that's my main job now. And about three years ago, I was students up in Liverpool, after I told them pretty much you know, a lot of what you guys heard today. They said, after they heard T-Bone's thing, at the end of it, they were like, we're going to start a page on Facebook for T-Bone. Oh, why don't we start a page for the T-Bone Appreciation Society? And there's almost 10,000 students on it now. For some reason, T-Bone's story really, really grabs the students. And T-Bone doesn't have internet. I print out his wall, I mail it to America. And he said the highlight of his day is reading all these questions and comments from the UK students. And he hopes when he gets released, he can get his passport come out and do some talks in the schools with me. So it's had a, you know, it's, it's had a good um, response and a good positive effect on T-Bone as well. T-Bone, he got found innocent of all of his major charges just last week. They were trying to give him 154 years. Basically, because he's served over 20 years, he's considered you know, a bad person. Because he's black, there's so much racism out there. I think it's one in 30 adult black males are in prison um, in America. It's a, so much racism. Because he's been in, in the military, he's considered dangerous as well, you know, so they just wanted to get him off the street, so they, they set him up on a bogus case, and he, he was on remand for two and a half years, I think. And he took his trial and said, I've not done these things, I'm going to go to trial, and the prosecutor said, you lose, we're giving you 154 years, you know. That's what they do with this plea bargain thing, they say, you're going to get the aggravated maximum if you go to trial, because if you, if you, the reason is, anyone who exercises their right to a trial is going to cost the state a lot of money. The whole justice system is a business model. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of millions to take people to trial depending on the, the magnitude of the crimes. So they say, we're going to give you the you know, aggravated maximum. That's why 98% of people in Arizona sign plea bargains. Now, t said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, I didn't do these crimes. And for a black man to stand up and, in an all-white jury in this racist system, and a jury to find him completely innocent. At the trial, the police brought forth a witness and um, his attorney then said, you know, we know this lady's a liar, don't we? So the lead detective said, yeah, I don't know if she's a liar. And the, the, the police, the main crime they were accusing of, there was a camera there, and they, they, they said to the police, where's the film from the camera showing that he's committed this crime? The policeman said, um, there was nobody that the police had time to get the film. This was at the trial. Because they just don't expect people to go to trial. They think you'll sign for anything, even if you're innocent. 
to avoid risking getting 150 for five years. Anyway, so T-Bone's got one minor conviction, and we're hoping that his, his sentencing just got postponed from Friday to 20th of this month, and we're hoping that he's just going to get back time and get released. And I've been in touch with the chaplain, I've been in touch with his wife, and we're trying to set up a support structure so that he won't go back to drugs when he gets out. He's in his 50s now, he should know better. Yeah. Okay, next question please, yes. Um, apart from your rape education, were there any other kind of education uh, classes available, was it? Okay, in the prison, there will be classes offered, and what it will be generally is a contract to do all these classes in the prison with buddies, corporate buddies of the people running the prison. Uh, and the prisoners just come in and sit down and do these classes and just go through the motions and no one's learning anything. And the reason they do the classes is because if they've got in trouble for drugs in prison and lost their visits or lost their ability to buy commissary, they want to get that back. So everyone's just going through the motions, they're not learning anything. There are all these corporate contracts that don't mean anything to the prisoners. And the prisoners are attending them just to play the system so they can get their visits back and they can get their ability to buy commissary back. It's all, it's all token. Yeah. Okay. And the, the medical staff, a lot of the medical staff were barred from public practice. That's why they've gone into the prison system. Yeah. Okay, anyone? Yeah. On a personal level, did you find it difficult once you got out of jail? To just to like, because you said you had difficulty finding a job like back in England. Yeah, I was, I was institutionalised. Um, my mum said I was like a puppy dog following her around the house waiting for orders. And I got offered the opportunity to speak in school right away. It took me about a year and a half before I felt mentally competent to do it. Um, the laws that apply in, in, in prison just don't apply to normal society. And even to this day, I prefer to sit in a restaurant with my back against the wall. Stuff like that, because anything can just happen at any time. Your adrenaline's going constantly. As soon as I went into prison, it's getting sound, used to the sounds of heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around, people getting carried on stretches, look like they were dead. And you're wondering how on earth I survived that, because I'm just a, a nerdy business graduate from, from the UK. Well, over 100 people arrested with me, including some of my bouncers, including my best friend Wildman, who's one of the main characters in my books. And they were protecting me, and then later on, writing became my currency. I started to write the life story of a mafia mass murderer called Two Tonys. He served in 125 years. He left the dead bodies of rival gangsters from Arizona to Alaska. And he took me under his wing, and we, we developed this really close friendship. And by the end of it, he, he, he said he felt, he felt like I was the son that he never had. Um, so yeah, you know, getting out of a system that's just completely alien to everyday life, you have to decompress from it. It took me about a year. I was living with my mum and dad for a year. And then I came and moved down south and started to get my work going and all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, you know, losing everything, having all that stuff taken away from me, has given me a whole new appreciation of life because I didn't know how to appreciate the small things. And now, you know, a good night's sleep. Uh, when I first got out, just being be able to walk down the high street and buy a banana or a pair of jeans was like the height of ecstasy for me. Uh, when you've lost everything and you get it back, you really, really appreciate what God. Especially here in the West when there's so much horrible stuff going on around the world. You know, really, really, I wake up with a smile on my face now. There's no cockroaches in my bed. There's no dead rats in my food. There's no guy threatening to thrash, smash my head in with a padlock in this, in this arm. So as harrowing as it was, it was actually something I needed to go through to grow up as a person and to learn a lot. I had to go deep inside myself to analyze the root causes of my addiction, which I was in denial about. Before I got arrested, I was like, yeah, I can have fun on the weekends, I'll never get in trouble. I was saying that until the SWAT team came, and the therapist said, are you a drug addict? No. Someone that wakes up and shoots up heroin and gets through the day, like, I'm not a drug addict. So Sean, an addict is someone who does drugs to the point where it affects the life. Take a look around, you know, we're at you look out the window, and, you know, gun tower and all that kind of stuff. And um, that taught me, I read over a thousand books in just under six years in there. I thought reading was frivolous beforehand. I read a lot of the original texts in psychology and philosophy. 
And I was, I was doing it to try and understand myself and my past behaviour on this fantastic journey through literature and it's just completely changed my values. Yeah, so you can take a book and Emma's going to write your name down and then she's going to collect the money later on. So, alright. Thank you for all your questions, cheers. Thank you.